Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here on this first day of May and third Sunday of Easter. And it's great to have all of you watching at home or wherever you might be. Welcome to Shalom United Church of Christ. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. You know, it's every week it's something new. It makes you want to come back and see what new thing we're going to do each week, doesn't it? So now we are still continuing to wear masks in the sanctuary. Oh, I can take mine off up here though, can I? Um, and during service, they are optional any, uh, anywhere else. If you're in the narthex, the fellowship hall, they are always a respectful choice, but they are optional anywhere except in the sanctuary. And the pastor, the liturgist, and the song leader can remove theirs while they're at the pulpit. Another announcement is if you are new or relatively new or back for the first time after a long time away and you are not on our mailing or email list, please sign the guest book. It's not the same as the sign-in sheet. It's at the desk beyond that. And give us whatever you want, your phone number, your email address, your regular address, and we'll make sure you get our weekly and monthly announcements so you know what events are coming up. And also, if you're new for coffee, there are blue and white mugs out there. If you use one of these, we'll know you're new and might want to get to know some of us. We promise not to swarm you. But we'll be happy to greet and meet you. And I believe Tammy has an announcement. Well, good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tammy Arnson. I am married to Evan Arnson. We have three boys, Olin, Zane, and Weston. Um, I am also an attorney with the Northwest Justice Project, and I serve on the nominating committee for Shalom. And that's that last one that brings me up here this morning. <laughs> Hopefully you've all seen a letter like this come to you in the last week or so from the nominating committee. It's the time of year when we start looking at what needs to be done for Shalom and who might have the time, talent, and skills to fill those positions. So in the coming weeks, you will hear more about the what of that. What are the positions? What are the tasks? What's the time commitment? But I would like to pause and take a moment today to tell you a little bit about the why. For me, the why is faith in this community. I have faith in Shalom, and I am here to tell you that the fact that Shalom is here matters. The messages that Shalom lives and sends out into our world matter. I know that I get a very different re reaction from people if I say I go to church or I say I go to Shalom. And that's because Shalom lives the messages that it preach, preaches. When we say, love your neighbor, we mean it. And we, we act on that. When we say, we're here for you no matter where you are on life's journey, we mean it. And we act on that. And I can tell you from experience that people in this community know who Shalom is and they notice. And for me personally, it is powerful to know that I'm part of a group that shares those fundamental beliefs and really acts on them. It's very meaningful for me that I can bring my kids here and trust the people that are teaching them to share those values. It's also really meaningful when I go out into the community and I see your faces, because on any given day in this time and in this place, I might be frustrated or angry with messages that I'm hearing around me, but your faces remind me that there is a community here that feels differently and acts differently. So I'm up here this morning to ask you to prayerfully and thoughtfully consider what that means to you, what your why is for being here, and what you might be able to contribute in terms of your time and talents and 
um, commitment to this community. Because Shalom matters, it has mattered since its inception, but it matters especially right now and in this place. So thank you for letting me share that with you, and um, please take our calls. <laughs> If you have questions, the nominating committee is myself, Jobetta Beaver, and Maggie Nielsen, and we're happy to take your calls, emails, stop us and ask questions. Um, we'll, we'll do whatever we can. Thank you. rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship. We have come from different backgrounds on various roads to get here, but we are all here seeking an experience of the Holy. God of life and grace, we gather in the hope for renewed lives. For we gather to offer you our thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 245, The Day of Resurrection. Oh. 
Please be seated. We come now to this time where we can share as community joys and concerns of our lives and of our friends and fellow sojourners. We uh, do that simply by raising our hand and, and, uh, and Beverly or I will bring a microphone to you. We will hold the microphone for you and uh, if you are able to stand, uh, please do so and, and announce your name and uh, your joy or concern. Remembering, of course, that we are a, a very public, we're in a public sphere and publicly uh, uh, throughout the globe. So share uh, what you can, uh, uh, honoring the, the privacy and confidentiality of others. Bruce W., a member of our congregation, had surgery Friday at Swedish Hospital in Seattle. His wife, Judy, reports that the surgery took eight hours and he's doing well. The successful surgery is a great joy to family and friends. So we remember Bruce and his family. From an online person, a viewer who goes by the name of Dusty has written us. She, uh, among th other things she's written, she says, my prayer request is for direction in my life and what church God wants me to join. I stayed with friends from your church, Larry and Mary, for several months who were very generous in taking care of me. And Dusty continues, I, I did not choose wisely in my move as I just found out that someone in the house vapes and I have asthma and other breathing issues and I was wondering why I was so tired and down. I had an uneasy feeling before I took a room in this home, uh, so I guess I need to listen better. Uh, please pray for another room to rent and thank you for your sermons and prayers. And that's from Dusty. I'd like to share a, a joy and a concern. Yesterday we had the annual meeting of our Pacific Northwest Conference. And uh, it was a good meeting. It was all online. There were 150, nearly 150 participants. Beverly and Laura Lee and myself were among those from Shalom participating. Uh, good reports were shared. Uh, a lot of amazing work is being done, but also a deep concern, a deep concern regarding anti-racism and pro-reconciliation efforts uh, in our conference and, of course, our communities of faith. So continue to keep Mike Denton and the conference leadership and staff in your prayers as they take seriously the call for equitable and just treatment of all people, especially people who've been marginalized historically and, and presently. So let's remember our conference uh, in our thoughts and prayers and support as well. Other joys or concerns that you'd like to share today? I'm Judy and um, I'm joyful because my son Jesse has uh, manufactured and launched his first uh, product for synthesizers. It's a Eurorack non-linear uh, sequencer and he's selling it on Etsy and um, he, he managed to sell enough uh, modules in the first week after his launch that he recouped his manufacturing costs and I'm real proud of him because he took his interest in synthesizers and went back to school uh, about three or four years ago and when he was a high schooler, he managed to graduate, and I'm talking on the day of graduation. We were waiting for a test grade that decided whether he was walking that night or not. He was on the deans and presidents list throughout his entire return to college because he had such great interest in the subject. And um, so he got a two-year degree in electronic technicians, and he has is using that both in his employment with a company that is teaching him all the aspects of developing modules and launching them. And now he has launched his first module. It's called Aristotle. Wonderful. And all of us need a non-linear synthesizer <laughs> sequencer, so get out and buy one. <laughs> 
Maggie Nielsen, and my joy is that I am a part of the nominating committee along with Tammy and Jovetta, who was sitting there. I was going to point her out so you all know who she is. And um, so be kind to us when we call. Uh, our twisting of arms is, um, is, is pleasant. So um, I'm looking forward, and they are too, to talking to many of you. I'm Reba Reese. Uh, I would like for you to remember my son, Mark, and Fritzy Reese in your prayers, that they will continue to be, have enough strength because they've been with their, uh, Fritzy's father, Vern McGann, maybe someone will remember him. He's in hospice, and they've been sitting with him for two nights. So, uh, we don't know how long this will be. And the, they put her mother uh, in uh, Alzheimer's uh, unit in Canyon Lakes. So they've been very, very busy, but remember them in prayer that they'll have enough strength to continue this uh, process. Thank you very much. Well, I'm Mary, and I am very thankful for the last uh, three days, four days, that my sister from Anacortes was visiting, and we just had a really fun time. And also, I am partly remembering my mother and Earth Day. This shirt came as inherited from my mother. Every day is Earth Day. Um, I'm Quinn. Um, I just need prayers for my hand. Um, I've been in pain for like the past two weeks, pretty limited range of movement. It's not broken. I got an x-ray and I got my results back and it's not broken. So <sighs> relieved about that because I don't have to be in a cast. Um, I'm going to probably start physical therapy for it soon, but just prayers because I'm in a lot of pain all the time. I also just found out um, the last couple weeks that my stepsister is going to have another baby. So we're very excited. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Laura Lee Sorensen. I just wanted to say that my nephew, Abel, is um, 10, turning 10? Turning 10 this Saturday, and he also has a couple of fun announcements. Um, I have a joy that I'm going to a baseball game for my birthday, and my dad came home on Friday, and I haven't seen them more than, for more than a month. And then I'm going, and then this summer, I'm going to be going to basketball camp, and I'm really excited for that. <laughs> of joys. Uh, one is that the tree we planted, it's almost five years ago, out there in the parking lot, none of my parents, is getting its spring foliage again. It's always behind the others, but it always makes it, and that makes me happy. And the other one is I planted some things for the first time ever. Now that I have a yard, some shrubs this weekend, and I am hopeful that they have a strong desire and to live. <laughs> They will overcome my bumbling gardening attempts. That's the prayer I pray for every plant I've ever planted. <laughs> Please live. Thank you for sharing joys and concerns. As we come to this time of silence and prayers of the people, we, we remember, we lift up those that have been mentioned and those who are also on our hearts. Let us be in an attitude of prayer.
God of all creation, lover of life and of everything, please help us to love in our very small ways what you love infinitely and in everywhere. We thank you that we can offer this prayer and that will be more than enough because in reality, everything and everyone is connected and nothing stands alone. To pray for one part is to pray for the whole and so we do. Help us each day to stand for love, for healing, for the good, for the diverse unity of the body of Christ, and for all creation. We know this is what you desire, as Jesus prayed that all may be one. We offer our prayer together with the holy names of God. Amen. All that we have is a gift from God, even our time and our energy uh, that allow us to do the work that we do is a gift from God. And so in this time of offering and gifts, we take this moment to return a portion of that which we have received so that the work of this community may continue within and without. I invite the ushers forward now to uh, receive our gifts and offerings. We bring these gifts in hope, in hope for a peaceful and fair world, in hope for an equal distribution of food, medicines, 
natural resources, and love, in hope for the well-being of Mother Earth and for many future generations. Thanks be to you, O God. Amen. Be seated. As we come to this time of communion, we have uh, just a few announcements related to the communion service. We, there will be um, the elements, the, the communion here at the table, and those serving will come forward and, and have the opportunity to share that with you. The bread we have is gluten-free. Let me make sure I read this right. Gluten-free, no dairy, no nuts, no soy. And... <laughs> And no high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> As I was told, that's sometimes for, for the children's sake. Um, I won't repeat what I heard Joyce say. <laughs> uh, and the chalice has grape juice, of course. We will have several stations today. There'll be a station over by the window where there'll be uh, some of the same uh, bread and juice, as well as the prepackaged cups, if you'd like to use those. And on the other side of the nano walls, there is also another station for communion that's available uh, for, for those worshiping in that area as well. Uh, all are, will be invited to come forward and to take a portion of the bread, to dip it into the cup and partake. We ask that you put your mask back on before you sit back down and to go down perhaps the side aisles uh, in some orderly fashion as we uh, come forward to, to receive. We also want to reiterate, underscore, all are welcome here. Uh, you're, 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 uh, nothing bars you from this table. If this is your first time in this community, you are welcome here. And these gifts, this table is, is offered as an invitation to you from this community by way of God to remind us how we share together this moment of common union, our communion. We thank the earth for all its bounty, and we celebrate all who are present here today in person and online. We give thanks for the hands that toiled in the soil that made it possible to eat this bread and to drink this cup. We acknowledge that as we come to this table, we recognize that we are different from one another. And those differences are not something that we tolerate. Those differences are the blessing that we share in this community. The more differences that we bring, the more we understand the fullness of our differences and our life together. We are all welcome, just as we are, in our imperfections, in our messy lives, in the right and wrong choices that we've made. We are welcome here. You are welcome here. We remember the sacred story of Jesus and his followers at his table that on the night that they celebrated and he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and said, this bread is for you to eat and to share. Remember that in the breaking of the bread, we are made whole, that in serving, we are served. And as grain is scattered into the loaf, so we who have been scattered are brought together in one communion. Jesus took the cup and poured it out. He gave thanks and shared it with his friends. Remembering the cup is the breath of life in which we come. And as the grapes find life in the vine, so do we as we drink this cup. Let us pray.
Gracious God, we bless this bread and cup. Bless all of us in our receiving that we may be renewed and that we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. This is the bread of life. This is the cup of life. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
time for the learning community for our young people to make their way to uh, the learning centers and uh, there they will have time to gather and enjoy some moments in learning. And hopefully we will do the same in our space. So, we invite the choir to come and share in this presentation of a musical gift for us. choir sounds so good every Sunday, and I can't imagine what it's going to be when they can take their masks off finally. Wow. I may not want to sit in the first row. <laughs> so today's scripture comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 27, the New Revised Standard Version. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. 
The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered into the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you in your, on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, Saul was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the child of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded many persons who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, some plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that, he might, so that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen Jesus, who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Today's long reading that Beverly read very well is, is part of a, of a familiar scripture, but I wanted us to read the part that wasn't typically read uh, in that scripture, because I think many of us are somewhat familiar. Perhaps we've heard this familiar and fantastic story of Paul's conversion to Christianity. That is, uh, he was making his way to Damascus, uh, gets blinded by the light, and hears the voice of Jesus. Uh, it's, it's a familiar and fantastic story of Paul's conversion to Christianity. And, and many have had conversion experiences, although I suspect few have, have, have that experience of being blinded by a light and falling off our donkey or, or hearing the voice of Jesus. Uh, as Catherine Caldwell Hoop has observed, many conversion stories are often more ordinary, uh, perhaps even humorous. And, and she goes on to list some interesting ones like someone who is converted from PC computers to Macintosh. <laughs> anybody, anybody want to bring a witness? Uh, or someone who discovers they actually like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> or the confirmed bachelor or bachelorette who finally decides that marriage might be just okay. Or more seriously, she writes, the brave soul who steps through the door of their first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Conversion experiences can be life changing. And today's scripture of Paul's conversion is about a life changing experience 
that leads to radical transformation, not only of his life, but in the communities that he has affected. The story begins with Paul. It wasn't read, but the, the verses just prior to what was read begins with Paul or Saul, as he's known before his conversion. He's on the road to Damascus. He's traveling on behalf of the Jerusalem Council. And he's going to Damascus to do what Paul has become known for and has become very good at, and that is persecuting uh, the Jewish Christians. It's participating in religious sanctioned persecution. He's going there to arrest them, to bring them back to Jerusalem for trial and perhaps execution. But as we, uh, as we recall today, his, his trip on the road to Damascus is intercepted, it is interrupted by uh, him being blinded by the light, and that's where we get the expression, blinded by the light, except his blindness is not metaphorical, it's literal. And he hears the spirited voice of Jesus who says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the voice instructs him to go to Damascus, even though he's blind, to go to Damascus, and there he's to find a man named Ananias. And that's where our story picked up today in the reading by Beverly. Ananias uh, is told of this man who's coming to see him, who's blind, and uh, is coming to be healed of his blindness. And Paul has been told to instruct to go and uh, meet this man named Ananias. Now, Ananias, when he hears about Saul, this man coming uh, to whom he's supposed to minister and care for, uh, Ananias is upset because he knows the reputation of this man. And he argues with God. Uh, he says, you can't be serious. Everyone knows this man and the terrible things that he's doing, how he's reigning terror among uh, Jewish Christians, the Jerusalem Christians. And now he says, and Ananias says, he's coming after us. But the heavenly voice persists. Don't argue. I've selected him as my personal representative. And so in spite of the protest, Ananias receives Saul, cures him of his blindness, his eyes are opened, and Paul is baptized. He seeks to be baptized and to join the Christian movement. That's, in a nutshell, the, the story that we have of Paul's conversion. Now you would think after such a fantastic experience that uh, the Christian community be, would be just opening their arms in welcome to Paul, the persecutor. And the people back in Jerusalem would have gotten word and said, something's going on here. Perhaps we ought to think about what we're doing in our persecutions. But this does not happen. Instead, the Christians are skeptical of Paul's conversion because they think it's a sham. They think they're using, he's using that as a way to infiltrate their, uh, their community and to haul them away to uh, trial and persecution. And the religious officials in Jerusalem also hear of the conversion, and instead of changing their ways, they now set out to persecute Paul. The persecutor becomes the persecuted. And in fact, uh, it will be that way for the rest of Paul's life. Some speculate that Paul will eventually die in prison because of this persecution. Now, this is a this is, a, this is an important story in the Christian faith, and it's important in how it talks about people coming to faith and the changes that happen, like the anthem today, a change will, will come. And it, this has often been used as a story to preach about conversion experiences or how people have been changed. In fact, on the back of your bulletin, there's a wonderful uh, story of a person who has experienced change in their life and their uh, Damascus Road experience through the camping program, through the UCC camps. And many of us who were raised in the, in the church programs at camp uh, can bring a similar story of ways that we've been changed, how we have been changed uh, through the camps uh, of our church. But the, but the focus I'd like to do today is different than anything I've ever done before. This, our, you know, you can blame the, uh, the Monday morning, uh, uh, you can blame that lady right there. 
the, uh, what, what's our group called? Spirit, Seasons of the Spirit Bible Study. Wow, did we get into a conversation on persecution. Persecution. This is an important theme. This is an important conversation that we need to have. Persecution. Um, that pervasive poison that occurs in society and occur, occurs in community and between communities and, and, and it's not limited to the time of Paul, right? <laughs> uh, the reality is human history is littered with acts of hostility and ill treatment of people. In fact, this scripture itself, this very scripture that we've just read has been used to persecute people. This one and other scriptures like it. To persecute not Christians, but to, for Christians to persecute Jewish persons, right? Last Thursday was Yom HaShoah. It's an observance that happens every year uh, in this time. It's the days of remembrance of, uh, of the victims of the Holocaust of World War II. And when I, when I was in Washington, D.C., every year I participated in what's called the reading of the names uh, at the uh, National Holocaust Museum there in Washington, D.C. And for eight days, Jewish leaders, uh, Christian leaders, Muslim leaders come together. And we, we gather in the Hall of Remembrance to read the names of Holocaust victims. Not only read their names, but we take turns reading the names of the victims for about 30 minutes. Each one of us takes turn and read the name of the victims and where they were killed. I remember one year uh, being presented a list. We're all given a long list. And we move to the center of this hall and there we, we speak the names. And on this list, there was a, na there was a duplication. There was a, a name, uh, two names that were exactly the same that were killed in the same location. And, and, and so I went to the organizer of the event and wondered if it was a, a typo, wondered if it was a mistake. And she said, no, it isn't. And she, she said, I, I suspect what had happened is that a young girl was given the name of her grandmother. And together they were, were taken away, carted away into the death camps and killed. And, and to this day, I can't shake the image of a, daughter, of a granddaughter and a grandmother that share not only uh, a name, but uh, the same persecution and same death. So that was last week uh, at the Holocaust Museum. For eight days, the names of victims are read in the Hall of Remembrance. And you would think for eight days of reading name after name after name after name after name, you would think that would cover all the names, but it doesn't even cover, it's a tiny portion, a tiny percentage. Just a fraction of the six million persons annihilated in the Holocaust. I mean, this is just one example of a long, long, sad, tragic history of humankind. I mean, last Sunday we, we, we lifted up, just for a moment in the service, the Armenians, right? The Armenians slaughtered during World War I by the Ottoman Empire. But to that horrible memory, we must also add genocide that's taken place in Rwanda, Cambodia, Bosnia, Darfur, Syria, and now Putin's war 
in, uh, in Ukraine, and yes, we're going to get to the United States. <laughs> there, there seems to be no end to these life-destroying practices, people doing horrific things to one another and causing so much suffering. It's time we had a conversation. It's past time that we had a conversation about persecution in our world and in our community. The reality is per persecutions do not have to result in killing, right, to do their damage. Like the targeted persecution going on right now in Florida against a corporation named Disney for its solidarity with the LGBTQ plus community. Or the persecution going on in Texas and Oklahoma and, and other states. The list is growing. The persecution of women and their right to choose. Likewise, it's not been that long since Christian churches had participated in lynchings, segregation of races. Some of you have told me the reason that you're at Shalom, and this is not a distant memory, some of the reason, the reason that you're at Shalom, some of you have told me, is because your former church sent out a pastoral letter to the congregation saying African Americans would no longer be welcomed in that church. That's what I said, really? This is recent history. I mean, within my lifetime, which seems recent to me. <laughs> but you took a stand and you left that church. Unfortunately, religious communities are still discriminating, as we well know, some based on race and so many other things, especially against transgender and non-binary persons. Faith com communities continue to turn a blind eye to persecution. To which I must ask, where are the atoning conversion experiences taking place today for these acts of commission and omission that are present even today. Like Paul, whose conversion saved him from a life of hatred and violence, we need a radical transformation in our world. As community, we need to examine our positions of power and domination, and we need to name our complicity in societal persecutions. Where harm has been done, we need to align with those uh, we need to align with that which restores community and participates in redemptive acts. And as a Christian community, we need to especially affirm that we worship the same God of Abraham and Sarah. We worship the same God of the prophet Muhammad. We cannot let the devaluing of Judaism or Islam be present in our midst. We are religious siblings. To one another. We are not enemies. As a Christian community, we need to stand shoulder to shoulder with our religious neighbors and voice our support to stand against anything or anyone who seeks to do harm. Does anybody want to say an amen to that? <laughs> Let's talk about some good news. On Friday evening, I visited the Tri-Cities Islamic community and, and broke bread with them as they concluded their Friday fast for Ramadan. And what a joy it was to experience their, the warm hospitality of that community as they gathered for iftar. And I was, I was so pleased and frankly surprised that the doors were wide open. Anybody could come in. And children came in, and women came in, and men came in. About 100 people, maybe more. Perhaps one of the most diverse communities there is in the Tri-Cities. I mean, I met people who had ties to Saudi Arabia, Iraq, 
Egypt, Jordan, Iran, Morocco. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And would you believe, uh, we were, uh, so we were sitting in, in little table groups. I was sitting with about six men. And yes, there was a place for men and a place for women and a place for children. And, and um, I was sitting with six men and would you believe our conversation turned to, well, I won't say persecution, but struggles. Well, I will say persecution, we didn't name it. But struggles between nations, between communities, between peoples, misinformation campaigns that take place in this country, the stereotyping of cultures and groups. And one of the men remarked, uh, this has been going on for, for centuries, to which everybody nodded. And I, being a preacher, wondering what I was gonna preach on this Sunday, asked the question, <laughs> What do we do about this? I mean, what, what, what do we do? What can we do? How can we, make this, how can we make changes? Can change happen? And there was kind of silence around the table until one man from Jordan spoke up. And he paused a long time until, until he spoke and he said something like this. He said, I think what we can do is to get to know each other, to know each other, to see each other. That's what he said, to see each other, to hear each other. He says, we, we have the same hopes, we have the same dreams, we have the same need for our children to grow up in, in, in safety and, and for our communities to live in peace. And then he, it was just coming to the end of the meal and, and he got up at that point, he got up and he went around and he shook the hand of every person at that table, looked us straight into the eyes. And as he shook my hand, I said, may it be so. Well, may we, to the best of our ability, cast our lot with our neighbors, especially our neighbors who struggle in this society. May we stand shoulder to shoulder with those who face maltreatment. I, this is our call, not only as citizens of the United States, I mean, that should be enough, but it is our call as people who seek to follow the way of Christ. To which I say, may it be so. Amen. Our last hymn this morning is number 495 called as partners in Christ's service. In body or spirit, I invite you to rise as we sing. Oh, 
Thank you for sharing with us in this time of worship. We have a time of fellowship and time of uh, sharing together uh, coffee and some goodies in, uh, in the narthex. And just a reminder, if you're relatively new to this community, we invite you to take a, a blue mug and, and use it. This will be your signal that uh, we can come and have a conversation with you. I would also say if you just want to talk to somebody and you want somebody to talk to you, take a blue cup and you will be spoken to. <laughs> in about 15 minutes or so, we'll ring a bell and then we'll join in the, in the uh, other hall for, uh, for time of feedback and we can share together our own experiences and, and wisdom. The sending forth. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the divine lift up the holy countenance upon you and grant you peace from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Amen.